All right, good afternoon. My name is Michael Hausenblas. I'm Chief Data Engineer at MapArt Technologies. And today I'm going to talk about the Lambda architecture or how I learned to stop worrying and love human fault tolerance. So let's have a look at what fault tolerance might mean in a distributed system like Hadoop, for example. We generally consider the hardware um, being commodity hardware um, not that reliable, right? We compensate for that using software, right? Wherever you look, HDFS, HBase, whatever, you have mechanisms in there that compensate for hardware going down, right? But what about the developer? So let's talk about developers. I'm not talking about that kind, we know that. I would argue it all started when we invited the elephant, somehow representing Hadoop, to the tea party. So things got complicated. You know, you develop something, and in the previous talk, if you've been around, we saw some very good examples there, having a staging area, having canneries around, and so on and so forth. But then at the end of the day, you still experience problems. And part of that talk is to raise awareness around that problem, and the other part is a suggestion, how to combat that. We also know that. I'm not going to talk about this uh, necktie interface problem. I'm talking about this, right? Worked fine in dev. It's an ops problem now. So let's maybe talk about human fault tolerance rather than developers. In general, developers are smart, motivated dev ops. Um, they know what they're doing. Most of the time. <laughs> so when things go wrong, and they can go wrong at any scale, we see that quite uh, interesting things. Twitter, banks, even Google has these downtimes. Quite often, something that went nicely and, and smoothly in a development environment, um, maybe even in the staging environment, somehow blows up into your face when you do it, when you put it into production. So I would argue from um, an architectural level, uh, if we can provide some guidance there, if we can equip people with um, a way of thinking about systems, um, at least half of that challenge is already addressed. So let's step back a bit. The Lambda architecture, uh, at least the name, um, the idea was probably around uh, for, for quite some time already, uh, was established by Nathan Martz, uh, used to work at Twitter, early on back type, and the creator of many goodies out there, Storm and Cascalog being two examples. He started to write on a book, and if you haven't checked it out yet, you might want to. It's uh, available under this URL. And uh, he had to come up with some name for that architecture, so he chose to name it Lambda Architecture. And why that is so, we will see in a minute. So, looking at the experience he had both at Backtype and Twitter, he essentially, or his team and, and uh, himself, put together a number of requirements they uh, thought would be desirable to have for such a system. It should be fault tolerance against both the hardware failures, or well, and human errors. That's probably something new. Uh, obviously, if you look at, at the workload that Twitter has, uh, not only this batch mode um, should be supported, but also low latency querying. It should have the capability of uh, scaling out linearly, so throwing more commodity hardware at it. And it should also be extensible. Right? The uh, business requirements might change, uh, your environment might change, your user base might change, so you want to have an accessible system being able to um, not only manage it and operate it, but also accommodate new features. And that's what he ended up with suggesting. And if you look at that part, that pretty much, if you turn your head 90 degrees, looks like Lambda, right? That's why it's called Lambda architecture. So you essentially have new data streaming in here, which is presented to or offered to both the batch layer on the one hand and the speed layer. In the batch layer, you have an immutable master data set and a batch process that computes the views. I'll come 
to an example and, and concrete implementations in a minute. So bear, bear with me for now, just trying to uh, appreciate some of the key terms like this immutable master data set. On the other hand, um, you have the speed layer that uh, essentially processes the stream and updates the real-time views. And then you want to combine these two to satisfy any given query, right? Very, very straightforward and simple, at least on an architectural level. So as I said, the batch layer, um, the main uh, task there is to manage that master data set, uh, hopefully because there all your, your data uh, should be available in a reliable way, uh, and given the scale of the operation, it should be you know, typically a distributed um, master data set. Um, and it should be able to pre-compute any arbitrary query um, yeah, that, that one could imagine. And the result of that are the batch views. And the serving layer essentially uh, indexes these views and can be queried in an ad hoc fashion. So there you have the, the low latency realized. And the speed layer, essentially, and I come back to that, this slide, compensates for the latency of the batch layer. So the batch layer, let's say, runs once a day or every two hours, and all the data that has arrived between the last run and now, which has not been absorbed into the master data set, is catered for or is served by the speed layer. Okay? So that's the kind of the things that um, how the, the architecture deals with um, yeah, um, the, the incoming data. And if you think about that, if you deploy, um, if you're a developer and you have something, some, some bug in there, it, even if that bug shows, it only shows for that time. The next time the batch run goes over that, um, your maybe inconsistent data or whatever goes away. Right? The, the batch layer essentially always takes the entire master data set into account. So let's have a look at a concrete example. I took that from openflights.org because they have the data available. You might want to do something else there. But for something concrete, an immutable master data set, and you have always these timestamps there, and that essentially says, this flight EI123 took off in Dublin at a certain point in time. And you got that for all the others. And you always ever append, you never update anything in place. So rather than um, updating for the next day this uh, record here, you would append another record there. You always keep the data around in its rawest form. You never update anything in place. The implication being, you better have a good data platform that uh, can handle that data. OK, so let's have a look at the views. So one very, very simple view, well, I had that one sentence in mind that counting is actually not a, a very simple operation, but a very uh, simple way of looking at things is I'm asking how many, airport, uh, how many planes are airborne. Right? So I go through that list, and all of them who have taken off but not landed yet are hopefully airborne. <laughs> yeah, <ex> <laughs> There might be exceptions. Um, or another view might be, provide me uh, an overview about airborne airplanes per airline. So I would go over that and take into account um, the airline identifier there. Or another one would be the airport load, so how busy is an airport, right? But you get the idea. You always look over the entire master data set, and uh, by applying a certain query, you get the views that are then served by, well, the serving layer. In case you want to learn more about Lambda architecture, we put together um, a website called lambda-architecture.net, um, where we're trying to document uh, implementations, use cases, and so on. And if you're in a position that you have already implemented this uh, Lambda architecture somewhere, please let me know, or my colleague, uh, Nathan, Nathan Binance, um, and we're happy to put that there as well. It's really meant to serve the community to yeah, document good practices. So coming to implementation of the Lambda architecture. So far, you know, an architecture 
that's nice. That's not very useful. You want to implement that, right? You've got a deadline, you've got people, and you want to implement that. So one of the things we're doing there on that website, on that advocacy website, is essentially listing the components that you could use for realizing certain layers. That alone is probably not too useful. You still need some experience around that. And I've gone essentially through a number of architectures I found in our user base and, and outside. And one of these things that somehow is a recurring pattern is, not very surprisingly, that for the immutable master data set, HDFS is used. For the batch layer, quite often Hive is used, or pig and Hive. Sorry for that. In the speed layer, you would typically see Kafka in front of Storm. Right? So these are things that we quite often find in implementations. And then the serving layer would, for example, be realized with uh, HBase, where you merge both the batch view and the real-time view. Right? So who, besides Ted, can spot the problem with this approach? Using Hive, deploying a storm topology, and so on and so forth. I'm not saying it's impossible, obviously. Customers have that in production. But what could you imagine, also in terms of uh, minimizing the potential error someone could um, you know, introduce there, what's the problem with this approach having many, many different systems, environments, languages, and so on? Well, the problem is that you're essentially repeating the business logic both in the batch layer and in the speed layer. Once you write your Hive query, once you write your Storm topology in Java, it's the same business logic implemented, including testing and so on and so forth, you're essentially maintaining um, parallel, on a logical level, parallel things, um, which leads us to the question, how about an integrated approach? Is there anything out there that allows me to do, to implement the Lambda architecture using one framework, one language, one platform? So there's Twitter Summing Bird released end of last year, which is a very nice approach. Um, not going to comment on that further, just pointing it out, it is there. There is Lemdoop, which uh, I believe will soon be open sourced. You can request a demo there on their site. And there is Spark. Who of you have heard about Spark already, Apache Spark? Cool. So I'm going to argue that Apache Spark is probably the best way, based on our experience, to implement the Lambda architecture. Reason being that it allows you to pick your language, Scala, Python, or whatever, um, develop both sides, the batch view and the speed, uh, the, the stream, streaming side, the real-time views, uh, using one framework, one paradigm. So a bit of a background to Spark, initially uh, developed by the AmpLab folks. We heard it in the earlier talk, uh, also Mesos is quite close to them there. Um, earlier this year, it uh, got uh, promoted into top-level Apache project, and uh, the kind of commercial shepherds are Databricks, and um, you can uh, get enterprise support from Hadoop distributions such as this. The Spark community has actually pretty rapidly grown, and uh, there you see contributors, committers, users, people who in generally do something with Spark, either contribute and or use. And from a kind of 100,000 feet view, the stack looks like that. So you got a data platform, and Spark, in a sense, is rather agnostic to that. It says, I don't care where the data comes from. Could be S3, could be HDFS, whatever. But at the end of the day, you need that data platform. You need something that, you know, where your master data set is. You have an execution environment, um, again, very uh, flexible. You can have uh, Mesos, you can have Yarn, you have a standalone mode where you don't need any other framework for that, uh, that essentially yeah, executes uh, the Spark core engine. And there is an ecosystem. And as you can see, there are things like Spark SQL or Shark in its previous um, form. 
Uh, the streaming part, which is micro-batch, you've got a machine learning part here, you have GraphX, and a number of other upcoming things there. So this allows you, if you look back at the challenge we had there, implementing the business logic both on the batch layer and uh, on the speed layer, to do that with one framework. Again, pick your language. Currently, um, there are three of them supported. It's Python, Scala, uh, Spark is itself is written in Scala, uh, and Java. And as far as I know, there are more to, to, to come up. So on the one hand, at least to me, Spark has a bit this MongoDB feeling. You download it, and you immediately get something done. You immediately can do some cool stuff. It is in this range of small data, something that probably fits on that laptop or on my mobile phone, to mid-sized data, to large data, something that very nicely also addresses this low end part, this mid-sized data part, where with a MapReduce implementation, you might sometimes run into problem justifying that. It also has a very expressive API. We know that API from good old MapReduce, it's Map and Reduce, right? However, that's what um, Spark offers. So a very expressive API, many of the things that uh, in MapReduce you would essentially either defer to higher level languages like Hive or PIG, um, or cascading or whatever, you get um, directly from Apache Spark there. Right? And we've again put together an advocacy site for that, uh, sparkstack.org, where we're trying to keep up with the news that um, come around that Spark stack. And now I have still some time for question and answers, which I hope we can enjoy. Um, have you ever tried using Stratosphere and how would you compare it to Spark? Like a couple I've of minutes ago, we had a talk about Stratosphere and this right. game tried to make a point of comparing with Spark. What can you say about it? Right. Uh, so the question was if I or we have used Stratosphere. I personally haven't. I'm looking at Ted. No? Okay. Um, would be very interesting to see that comparison there. Um, have you got uh, some previous experience with, with Stratosphere yourself, or? Sorry? Just a, Just a bit. Okay. And if you contrast that with what I showed so far here, would you say there is a one-to-one -one fit? <laughs> Sorry for sending you around. Try to keep it a bit interactive. Okay. Yeah, it has uh, strong support for iterative algorithms. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. basically, it's a strong feature, I would say. And then also they um, emphasize the optimizer, which I'm not sure how Spark uh, is uh, compared in this respect. Right, right. As I said, I would be very interested in, in having a comparison. And I think Ted also has some comment on that. We get that. Hi, uh, we're running a fairly large Hadoop cluster and yeah. it's um, operationally fairly heavy. We spend a lot of time keeping it running. Right. Um, is Spark similar in that aspect is my first question. And the follow-up question is if Spark is easier to operate, you still need some storage layer like HDFS. Right. Right. Uh, if you want to avoid the operational elephant of a Hadoop, or right. do you have suggestions for other options? Right, right. I guess that was, even though I only made this point shortly. Um, so this is, if you, for example, um, download Apache Spark from the Apache website, or it comes with MapR, or wherever you want to get it, this is what you get in its core. But in order to operate that, as you rightly pointed out, you want that. So the question is, for example, if things like high availability, um, disaster recovery, and so on, are important to you, then I would say, well, you probably want to have a, a data platform that really can offer that, that really can deliver on that. 
So here in the execution environment, you have got a lot of choices, right? So you might want to go with Yarn. You might, if you have been around in the earlier talk, want to try out Mesos there. Or for certain applications, the standalone mode might be sufficient, depending on if you have different workloads in your cluster or not. Um, but I would argue that many of the enterprise demands and, and features um, such as HA and DR are probably met in these two layers. And I think Ted wanted to... Sorry, does that somehow... Yeah, um, zooming in on the storage, are there any alternatives to HDFS, basically? Michael's being too nice. <laughs> I'm wearing a red hat. So, yeah, there are alternatives. Uh, so there are commercial hardware alternatives, EMC, NetApp, both provide reasonable storage appliances, and MAPR, <laughs> the guys with the buttons falling off, uh, have a uh, high-performance HDFS clone that provides HA, that provides much easier operational setting than stock Hadoop, and gives you read-write access. But it's an open source conference, so the speaker is trying to be very good and not say these things. Uh, but we'll talk about it later if you want offline. And Spark itself is very easy to run. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. I guess that's what I tried to point out with that's the MongoDB experience. To me, that says everything. I don't know, maybe, maybe it doesn't say to everyone, but you know, right. download it and you get it immediately. The MongoDB experience means easy to install and yeah. lose data later. Uh, which Spark you get, you get you get you get started easy, right? That that yeah, was the so part. Spark doesn't do that. Okay. Oh, we yeah. Got, yeah. Um, uh, from my uh, experience with Spark, yeah. we have been using uh, not yet in full production, but uh, for a few months. Okay. Um, when uh, it's a, uh, exactly it's uh, fairly easy to use. The the shell is great to learn it extra. The main problem we had was that uh, it's difficult to tune the, the memory usage and uh, it does not degrade uh, gracefully when uh, the data, data sets are big. Sometimes the, the cache right. does end up a bit uh, uh, on the disk, great, right? right. and sometimes you just have uh, out of memory errors. Right. What are your suggestions? Yeah, so the thing is, I intentionally I, I put in the second part around Spark to kind of suggest the best practice how the Lambda architecture, which itself might you know, look rather ab abstract, um, how you can realize that. It's intentionally not a talk about Spark. I'm happy to you know, offline take that further, but the, the, the main problem, or one of the architectural decisions there is that essentially the driver program um, in Spark um, you know, has, has the whole control there, and it's also you know, consuming as much memory as, as it can find. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, so, as far as I know, there are a number of um, things coming up that uh, might address that in maybe already in, in 1.0. I don't know. Um, but as you said, this is something where <laughs> there's still a lot of, of uh, yeah, community resources uh, that needed to be documented and shared uh, necessary. It's, it's nothing that, you know, there's a simple and clear answer, do X, Y, Z. It is as you said. It's it's a, a known issue there. Yeah. Uh, hi, I had a question. Uh, hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I haven't really used Spark much, yeah. but I was playing around with it uh, a couple of weeks ago, and a key phrase that kept uh, coming up in the literature was "in-memory map reduce." Right. Now, so that sort of made sense when I read a little, little more. But could you, you know, elaborate a little more on how it works when the data is really large and doesn't really fit in memory? Right. Right. So. Yes, the, the core idea are these RDDs, these resilient distributed data sets. And again, it's not a Spark talk, so <laughs> that's why I spared out all these details. Um, so you essentially have a data set that you apply some transformation and you apply the transformation resulting into a new data set. You can pin these data sets into memory even on startup to you know, have it already cached, uh, which, which is a lot uh, of speed up. The question is still, what if um, the data set does not fit in memory, the simple answer is it will spill to disk. So it will become slower, right? But that's what I said in terms of um, you might not have a big data problem, but something that is where your standard relation database or whatever you're using uh, essentially chokes on. So you want to have something that uh, as your data grows, 
is able to deal with this mid-sized data, but also you know you can um, crunch a bigger um, sizes of, of data sets as well. And um, I've seen some of these migrations where you might have, I don't know, pig and hive scripts uh, together. Uh, and you might keep for, you know, going through five petabytes, you might keep your pig script around there, right? Um, because it's a batch job, it runs once a day, so, you know, the, the SLAs, the, 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 um, whatever you need to guarantee that the job is done at a certain time or whatever is not that critical. And uh, in terms of throughput, the, the MapReduce pick by extension um, is, is still a very good way to go, right? So I'm not saying that uh, throw out Hadoop and MapReduce and whatever, uh, but have a look at if you have Spark on the one hand and uh, TESS and other uh, things on the other hand, uh, maybe Spark can offer you more integrated approaches, I call it. There might be other people calling it different ways, but a more yeah, easier way. We have uh, Also, to address the last two comments, one of the purposes of Lambda architecture is that you don't run very large batches. You run, in the real-time layer, a very moderate load. In the batch layer, you run the last partition to, to, in a batch mode so that you can always rerun that in a partitioned way. And so you don't wind up having to handle a very, very large amount of data in one, in one single run. And that makes Spark a very natural component in Lambda <laughs> because of that. And Spark SQL, I think, is compatible with Hive syntactically, so you can mix and match the execution mode that's appropriate for whatever you're doing. Yep. I think we have one more question here. Yeah. Um, just throw it. Hey. Hi. Uh, one of the things you mentioned about the Lambda architecture is that the there's an immutable storage which just goes append only, right? Right. Uh, isn't there like sort of like an intrinsic scale issue there? As over time, you like even if your data set is like fairly fixed, right? Aren't right. you saying that year, two years from now, three years from now, you're going to have like an increasing, and at some point you're going to hit a scale limitation? So I guess there are two answers to that. So the, the question, in, in case uh, it's not, not uh, clear, at least as far as I understand, isn't there a scalability issue um, somehow implying, okay, you need to keep all the data around, right? Um, so on the one hand, obviously, or not so obvious, we are dealing with schema on read in this setup, right? So the application essentially decides how to interpret these things, which offers a lot of flexibility because what you thought today in this application is the right schema might change with a different use case or different business requirement, whatever. So that's definitely an upside. The down, downside is, yes, you need a very good data platform where you can keep all of that around, right? Uh, you might, uh, if, if you're really dealing with large you know, in the hundreds of petabytes or whatever, might consider, um, for example, um, formats like Parquet or Org that in itself have a more compact representation, binary compact representation, rather than a CSV file, for example, right? Um, you might uh, want to, if you say this 10-year-old data, if you have it in operations for 10 years, this 10-year-old data, you can aggregate that a bit, for example. Um, I would argue that there is not enough knowledge or experience in the community yet to really say, okay, here are the three options how to deal with that. But yes, we're talking about a data platform that can easily you know, store and manage petabytes of data, which, yeah, hopefully is available. How are we doing time-wise? Is there one more question or? So one last question. Okay. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so from what I read about Lambda architecture, it was more about that you would always uh, recalculate the batch over your entire data set. Mm -hmm. But now Ted mentioned that you would rather always just recalculate the last partition. So are there just two different approaches that you can both go or? In, in, the, in the batch layer, yes, right? So you, you look at the, at the entire master data set and create the views over the entire master data set, yes. Okay. Depends on your 
Right. Are you worried about errors? So every partition that might have errors, right. then you should recompute if you can partition it. If you can't partition it, right. if it's an, uh, not an aggregating sort of thing, then maybe you have to run every, all, every bit of data all at the time. Your choice. Okay. Thank you.